Welcome everyone to week number six of Biology 120. We've just got a couple of weeks left, so let's get moving. Uh, by the way, this is one of my pictures from about two weeks ago. <clears throat> one of my favorite pictures with an eastern tiger swallowtail butterfly on a sunflower along with a bumblebee. Okay, so last week you learned about DNA, the structure of DNA, how it replicates or makes a copy of itself. You learned about mitosis, <clears throat> which is a type of nuclear division uh, where the chromosomes are replicated and then they're divided up to end up in daughter cells that are just like the mother cell. You learned about transcription and translation, <clears throat> which are actually the job of DNA to make all the proteins that the cell needs because most of those proteins are enzymes and enzymes run the biochemistry in cells. So that's the importance of DNA, that all the information for making those enzymes is present there. The chapters for this week, <clears throat> excuse me, are chapters 11, 12, and 47. 11 is about meiosis. Meiosis is a different type of nuclear division where the chromosome number is halved, cut in half. <clears throat> and so human beings have 46 chromosomes through the process of meiosis. That number is cut down to 23. Well, which cells do meiosis? In human beings, <clears throat> that process happens when we make our gametes, our sex cells, either our eggs or our sperm, depending on our gender. So that's very important because when you have an egg and a sperm that unite, you have to end up with a total of 46 chromosomes, which is normal in a human being. <clears throat> Chapter 12 is about inheritance patterns like dominant recessive traits, and there are others, X-linked, Y-linked, there are incomplete dominance. There are lots of different inheritance patterns. And you're also going to learn about Gregor Mendel, who is really the father of Mendelian genetics. Uh, hence, we named Mendelian genetics after him. <clears throat> and also, you're going to learn about some biodiversity. Biodiversity all the way down on the gene level, because you've got to have a mixture of genes found in a population in order for the population to be healthy. For example, in cheetahs. So cheetahs are still around. They are not extinct, but they do not have genetic diversity. Their genes are very, very similar to each other. So if some particular de disease comes through that affects cheetahs, <clears throat> that species may go extinct. Excuse me, I've got a tickle in my throat. So you'll learn about biodiversity. Read through the Module 6 overview and watch the videos. The one on meiosis is really good from the Amoeba Sisters. I generally like their videos, but this one is really good because it shows a comparison between mitosis and meiosis, and that helps you understand them. And then also a video on epigenetics, which you will need for the discussion board postings. <clears throat> so let's get into that. You got discussion board postings this week and a journal entry. Plus, you're going to be working on your final project, so don't forget that. But the discussion board postings this week will be about epigenetics. So epigenetics means above the genes. So there's some other control going on besides just the genes that are turned on. <clears throat> so what exactly does this mean? You have all different types of genes in your DNA. Genes are segments of DNA that code for particular traits, which almost always means they code for a particular enzyme. <clears throat> if you think about it, in every one of your cells, you have all the genes that are necessary to make you a human being. But all those genes are not turned on in any one cell. A heart muscle cell does not look like a brain cell, does not look like a nerve cell that runs in your body, does not look like a white blood cell, does not look like a skin cell. <clears throat> so, the genes in these different cells, different genes are turned on. The turning on and off of genes is really what epigenetics is about. How can we control this? How does it work? 
<clears throat> where are these switches or triggers that turn on and off genes? That's epigenetics. And it is a hot area of research right now because we understand a lot about genes now. Genes in different organisms, human beings, fruit flies, E. coli, uh, you know, all different species. But we really don't understand how epigenetics works yet. So hot area of research. You're going to discuss epigenetics because that is in that video that you need to watch. And you're going to have a discussion about how much nature plays in you as an organism and how much nurture plays. So nature refers to the genes, genes that you have present in your DNA <clears throat> versus how the environment or the nurture side of um, the effects that determine who you are plays in who you are as a human being or who you are as an organism. So the environment includes how you're raised, um, the stresses on your life, um, the chemicals that you come in contact with, how much sun exposure you have, you know, all those different things is, is environment. And genes are what are built into your DNA. <clears throat> this has been debated for a long time now, but especially since the early 1900s through now, there's been huge debates about this. How much uh, does nature play in who, uh, who you are and how much does the environment play, in who, play into who you are? Your journal entry is, <clears throat> there are a lot of questions in that journal entry, so make sure you cover them all because I'll be looking for them all. How bacteria reproduce and how bacteria get new genetic information. So bacteria reproduce in a very simple asexual process called binary fission. A bacterium just splits in half after, of course, you know, it makes a copy of its chromosome and that sort of thing. Um, but it's a very simple process. One bacterium just splits in half. You get two daughter cells just like the mother cell. Well, that creates a problem for a bacteria. How do they get new traits? Through different processes. That is found in Chapter 22, Section 2. If you go right to that spot, in your free OpenStax textbook, Biology 2nd Edition, you will find the answers to this. Mutation, conjugation, transformation, and transduction. These are ways that bacteria get new genetic traits. So this is very important because if bacteria didn't get new traits, they would never be able to survive in different environments. Survival of the fittest, remember? So, um, <clears throat> they have to have a way to get new genetic traits. You're going to talk about sec asexual reproduction versus sexual reproduction and the advantages and disadvantages to each. Okay, bacteria do not have to put on deodorant every day to attract the opposite sex. All right, just saying they just split in half and that they're done with their reproduction. So there are advantages and disadvantages to each. You're also going to have a discussion of biodiversity, especially having to do with sexual reproduction, which I'll show you again in another slide in just a second. Because we talk about biodiversity on a population level, on an ecosystem level, but we also talk about it having to do with genes all the way down on the genetic level. Uh, you're going to need a definition of evolution because that is part of this. <clears throat> So the def my definition of evolution is a change in genes and a population over time. Real short and simple. Change in genes and a population over time. <clears throat> we know that populations change over time. Even human beings do. Once upon a time, whoo, way back, way back, whoo, I'm trying to think, into the 80s or beginning of the 90s, I visited Boston. And I went on a tour of the U.S. Constitution, the ship that is in the harbor there in Boston. <clears throat> I went on a tour of it, walked through it, and I had to bend over. Okay, I'm 5'6". So I had to bend over the whole time that I was walking through it. And then I looked at the beds, and I was shocked. 
There is no way I could lay down on one of those beds because I would have my knees up to my chin. And I figured out that, oh, even men back then were shorter than I was at that time. They were all shorter. Otherwise, there's no way they could fit into those beds. Um, so human beings have changed over time in just a couple of centuries. <clears throat> so populations change over time and they change in their genetics also. That is where we come up with evolution, change in genes in a population over time. You're also going to talk about genetic erosion in agriculture. We're losing more and more species of livestock and plants and um, I guess chickens and turkeys and all those are considered livestock. But we're losing these species and varieties <clears throat> because we have huge farming operations. And the farming operations want to use the most efficient animals to get the most meat, the quickest way, the cheapest way. And so we are losing lots of these species and varieties. There's a big push now to um, start using again heirloom varieties. There are things called seed banks. So check into all of this because you're going to talk about genetic erosion in agriculture in that journal entry. And then finally, you need to be working on the slides for your final project. I have graded milestones one and two, so get started on those. I'll get to that milestone three as soon as I can. You're going to put all three of these milestones together in the form of slides. All of them will be slides with speaker's notes to make your final project. I have made comments. I have made suggestions in the graded rubric. So please look at those. Please fix what you need to fix in at least the first two milestones that I have graded right now. <clears throat> Get working on that because this will be due in week seven and you'll have a lot going on in lab also if you're taking the lab. So it is good to get that started now and get it finished if you can. Okay, I want to cover a couple of extra subjects real quickly. So uh, let me talk about those because these have to do with genetics. So we talk about genes and I gave you a definition of a gene. It's a portion of DNA that codes for a particular trait, and that usually means making an enzyme. But genes equal traits, and here are some examples that I'm giving you right here. Albinism trait is the lower left picture where the production of melanin is not present in someone. <clears throat> uh, Marfan syndrome is a dominant trait that you see in the middle picture, and you notice what um, trait this man has. He has grown exceptionally tall. He has big hands and big feet. Um, they have a lower lifespan because they have a lot of medical problems growing this tall. <clears throat> they have a lot of back problems and mobility issues, but they also have a problem with their aorta. The aorta, which is the major artery coming out of the heart going into the body, um, is weakened and can split open and there's not a lot that you can do about that when it happens. Um, there have been famous basketball players that have had Marfan syndrome. And you can see why this would come in handy uh, if you want to play basketball. And down in the lower right hand corner we see a recessive trait and this is sickle cell anemia and you notice what is happening to some of the red blood cells. They are becoming distorted under low oxygen conditions. You see right in the middle there a picture of a normal red blood cell and the sort of oval shape with indentations in the middle. That's the normal shape of a red blood cell. And it can travel very well through capillaries. Capillaries are the smallest blood vessels that are found in the body. <clears throat> and they are just wide enough for a red blood cell to travel through. They are very teeny tiny blood vessels. But when cells sickle out, like the ones that you can see here, they get stuck in those capillaries. And that means that the tissues don't get oxygen. And if there's too much obstruction in a particular tissue, you get death of that tissue. Um, they say that sickle cell anemia 
when the patient is going through a crisis is extremely painful. And you can see why, because your tissues are not getting oxygen. And that is a recessive trait. So I just wanted to talk for a second about a few traits. I wanted to mention epigenetics again. Remember what it is, is turning on and off genes. And we really don't completely understand those yet. So it is, like I said before, a hot area of research. So it's gene expression. When it's a gene is turned on, when it is turned off, and just think what we could do if we could figure this out. You could turn on the right genes in a skin cell and make that cell become white blood cells that would help someone who was immune deficient. You could cure spinal diseases, spinal injuries, because you could turn on cells to become spinal cord cells. And there it is. You could cure any kind of problem like that. You could cure heart disease, um, diabetes. You could cure all kinds of diseases if you understood how to turn on and off the correct genes at the right time. The nature versus nurture issue is always really interesting. Um, like I said, it's been uh, hotly debated for many years, at least well, over a century now. Um, <clears throat> hot area of research, too, because nature, of course, is really important. Psychologists like to study the nurture aspect of it. I'll have an extra video for you about identical twins that were separated at birth. And if you watch it, you can see how many of the mannerisms are the same in these two women. Um, and, of course, how they look alike. But... Their mannerisms are similar, which is very interesting. Uh, and some of their interests are the same, too. I also will put, this is hilarious, but um, a trailer for a movie called The Bad Seed from 1956, where this issue is talked about. Um, because there is a bad little girl called Rhoda, who, really bad, she's psychopathic. Um, <clears throat> And the movie is about her and what happens to her. So I will put the trailer there. And if you have a chance, go and watch that movie because it is awesome. Really old, black and white. Yeah, I know. But it is very fun to watch, even though it's a horrible topic. The importance of sexual reproduction. I have the Duggar family here, you know, 19 and County or whatever it is now. I don't remember. But, um... <clears throat> Whether you like them or not, it's interesting to look at them because these two parents had all these children, 19 of them, and if you notice, when you look at them, they are all different from each other. Hmm. Even though it's the same two parents. And this is the importance of sexual reproduction. In human beings, each woman can make 8 million different types of eggs through different combinations of her mother and father's chromosomes through the process called meiosis. The father can make another 8 million different variations of his chromosomes from his mother and his father in his gametes, the sperm. And so you have 8 million times 8 million multiplied together as a gigantic number and those are the number of different combinations that you're going to get to make children. That's why all these children look different from each other. Now, saying that, they also have different biochemistry, right? So they don't just look different from each other. They have different biochemistry. I'll give you an example of that. <clears throat> My sister hates cilantro. She says that it tastes like soap. I love cilantro, and we are very close in age, in our upbringing. It has nothing to do with our upbringing, of course. Um, we look a lot alike, but she hates cilantro because it tastes like soap, and I like it. Um, she also has the same problem with the sweetener sucralose. It tastes like Clorox because of chlorine in it, chlorine groups in this sugar. 
I taste it. I don't taste that <laughs> chlorine taste at all. So there's a difference in our biochemistry. There's a difference in your immunity. There are all kinds of differences besides just the way that we look. And you're going to be studying about biodiversity, and I put some different species here and a couple of ecosystems. And like I said, there's biodiversity all the way from the gene level, which is tremendously important, all the way up to the ecosystem level, different ecosystems in different areas. You have biodiversity that's important in populations, which also has to do with the genes. Um, so you're going to learn some more about that this week. All right, I know this is kind of a long video, so I want to get off here and wish you all a good week. If you need anything, as always, just let me know. m.sigmund at snhu.edu. Have a wonderful week.